in this video I'm going to be bringing background music out of the background because we're going to put it up front and centre and take a good look at the highly collectible Seberg BMS 1000 music system. Let's get on with it. Background music machines first arrived on the scene in the US after World War II, although they only really started to become popular in the late 1950s. Much of the increase in popularity could be put down to pseudo-scientific studies sponsored by Muzak, who were the largest providers of background music systems. These studies showed that playing background music in offices and factories would increase worker productivity. To give you an idea of how these studies provided the results that Muzak required, consider this example. Muzak had two different types of music, a more mellow one for offices and then an upbeat one for factories. Their music was primarily transmitted over FM multiplex signals to the location. So if you wanted to broadcast to both offices and factories, they'd need two different FM transmissions. So they produced a scientific study that showed that background music was much more effective if it was only played for 15 minutes and then silenced for 15. And of course this then meant that the same FM transmission could play to both offices and factories and the base stations would have timers that switch the receiver on and off at the appropriate times. I think that's pretty crafty. However, despite the dubious nature of the claims for background music, companies ate it up and by the early 1960s it was a multi-million dollar industry, so it naturally attracted interest from a number of competitors. The most successful of these other companies was Seberg, the jukebox manufacturer, and they brought out their Seberg 1000 system. Now I should point out that in some parts of this video I've been calling this the Seberg BMS 1000, which is probably not strictly correct. It's either the Seberg 1000 or the Seberg BMS for background music system, but I'm sure you're going to give me a pass on that. Anyway, the Seberg system, rather than being received by airwaves or through leased telephone lines, was distributed on vinyl records. Let's go back to Liberace to explain more. The discs used in the BMS 1000 system are a non-standard size for records, 9 inches across with a 2 inch diameter hole in the middle. Now a standard LP is played at 33 and a third RPM, these are played at half that speed, 16 and 2 thirds RPM. There's 20 tracks on each side, so 40 tracks on a disc, which is about 80 minutes worth of music on one record. It plays one side and then the other, and then it plays a total of 25 in the machine, so that's where the 1000 comes from, because you've got 40 tracks times 25 discs, that's your 1000. So BMS 1000, 1000 tracks, approximately 37 and a half hours worth of music. And of course when it gets to the end, it doesn't stop, it stacks them all up again and starts back at the beginning. Now Seberg offered three different kinds of music. You had the basic library, the mood music, or the industrial library. If we look at the description on industrial, we can see here that it contains the occasional polka and march, emphasis on popular music, minimum of stringed instruments, unusually rhythmical, overall lively character, but never a rock and roll, designed for industrial plants only. Obviously up-tempo, so as to make people work quicker. Now these discs, the most common ones you'll find, are the basic library. The box I've got here contains 28 discs because the later machines held 28 rather than the 25 that I mentioned earlier on. This says place in use 1st of October 1968 at the bottom there. Notice the index on the right BA101A that's to indicate where it goes in the stack on the opposite is BA101B and it works its way through the stack until the final disc is BA128B. Now, I mentioned that these were collectible and the reason is because they're not supposed to be here anymore. Every quarter you get a set of seven records in a box like this. You can see at the top here it says remove the records where the numbers apply and match the ones inside the box then swap them over. So basically you're replacing a quarter of your records every four months. But notice here at the bottom you're supposed to get your old records, put them in a box and send them back and they will destroy them. They don't reuse them and if they don't get them back the distributor gets a fine of 22 cents it says at the bottom there. So yeah everyone was incentivized to destroy the these records. That's why they are collectible. There shouldn't be any of these records anymore. The ones that survived are the lucky ones. They continued to issue Seberg BMS records into the 1980s, but those later discs are very rare because less and less people had the machines and they issued the discs less frequently. You're more likely to find discs from the 1960s. In the late 1970s, they changed the titles of the three categories to Penthouse, Lifestyle and Mellow Mood. 
So the discs are hard to come by, but then again, the machines that play them, they're, if anything, even harder to get hold of. This machine that you see here is the BMC one. This is the more common of the two designs of machines that came out. This one first was released in 1963 and continued on in this style all the way through. It's an ugly machine. It's designed to be hidden away in a cupboard. It requires a separate preamp and a separate amplifier attached to it. So this is just the playback device. You can see on the front here, we've got two switches on and off and reject. Reject just drops the disc off and goes to the next one. And you're supposed to have a lock in that hole on the front that's missing here. This is the first machine I got hold of and uh, I was going to get this up and running. And as it was, it doesn't really work very well. It's got a number of issues. It really needs to be stripped down, taken apart. However, luckily, shortly afterwards, I managed to find the machine I really wanted, which was the BMS one. This is the machine really favoured by the collectors. And unlike the BMC one that you want to hide away in a cupboard because it's so ugly, this one you want to put up front and centre because it's a really attractive looking device. Now, I got mine shipped from the US, which is always a bit of a risk. And sure enough, when I opened the box, there are all these things rattling around inside the bottom of it. I'm sure some of these things are probably quite important. At least I thought so at the time. So I switched it on with a bit of trepidation. But despite my reservations, it fired up and started playing a record. Okay, so it's a bit wobbly, but look, it's working. Now, one reason that it's playing slow, which hopefully you notice there, is because, of course, it's expecting a 60 cycle signal, 60 hertz from the US power supply. The UK one is only providing it with 50 hertz. So rather than swap out all the motors, which is something I don't even think I'd like to do, or maybe adjust bearings and things, I got a sine wave converter, which will convert the 50 hertz up to 60 hertz and increase the speed. All I have to do with this is splice it into the power line that's supplying the power to the motor and I'll just have to take apart this connector here and I was hoping to find a connector which I could put on there but I was unable to find one so instead I just snip that one off and then soldered in the wires into the existing wire taped it all up and this is what it does sound like Okay, so that's job number one done. The next thing is, of course, it'll need a little bit of oil on that motor. It's obviously running a little bit wobbly there. And it gives you instructions on how to do that. There are two little pipes on the motor. You can see it at the bottom and the top. And the idea is to put some motor oil into those. Just a few drops and that should get the motor running a little bit smoother. And I've got some of that oil, so I'll put that in there. It'll take a while to wear in. But the other thing I noticed... The disc that I got with it, supplied with it, this one's got scratches all around the edge. And I thought, well, how's that happening? Then I had a look, and this turntable at the bottom here, it doesn't actually play off that, but it does touch the discs at some point, and it's turned to sort of sandpaper on the outside. There's supposed to be a sponge loop on there. So I stuck some self-adhesive felt pads to the platter to keep the records away from that abrasive section. And the next job was just a bit of tidying up, including the chrome on the outside of the case. It's supposed to look nice and shiny, and obviously it's got tarnished. Now, I was going to try that trick of polishing this up with kitchen foil, but I didn't need to bother. I found this stuff in the cupboard. Silvo, the lesser-known brother of Brasso, and tried that out. It did a perfect job, took all that tarnish off there, made it look basically as good as new again. So now it's just a matter of putting everything back in the right place and I'll talk you around the machine. So first off, you've got a double-sided stylus here. There's one on the top and then another one on the bottom. And you'll notice when the stylus goes back into its position, it also rubs on this little brush here to take any fluff or residue off that stylus. Now it plays the underneath of the record to start with and it would play it to the middle unless you press the reject button, which I've just done now. It drops it down and then it plays side B, which is on the top. Remember, we start at side A at the bottom and work our way through to the 25th discs on side B at the top. And I'll just press reject on this one as well. So then that one drops down and then it'll start playing the underneath of the one above. Now, I am missing one component from this machine. It wasn't in the other one either. And it's a metal disc that's supposed to sit on top of the stack of records and provide some downward weight. And of course, that will help when you're playing the records upside down. As it is, without that, they do tend to wobble about a bit when you get to the last one. I've ordered a custom-made weight, which is in the post at the moment, but I haven't got it here yet to show you. Now, when all your records have played and fallen into the lower position, this lift mechanism then moves them all back up again into the original position. You've got to think this would normally have 25 discs on there. 
and once it's put them up there it then moves out of the way and the stylus moves back in and starts playing back at the bottom of disc one again. You've got to think this is a very reliable mechanism. This thing could have been made in the early 1960s and been in operation for decades playing music continuously all week long. They don't make them like this anymore. Now my machine is supposed to be able to hold 25 discs. The BMC one could hold 28 according to the specs. You might be able to get 28 in this if you squeeze them in at the top there. Now I'll show you around the back of this thing, although this is the part that's really supposed to be hidden away, not particularly attractive. However, on the left hand side of this we can see we've got various inputs and outputs. You can put a microphone into this to use it as some public address system and you can also wire in things like an external radio. Now I mentioned earlier on that the cheaper, later and uglier BMC machine required an external preamp and amplifier. The BMS doesn't. It has those built in. It also has a built in speaker. This is the kind of thing that rather than being hidden away is supposed to be shown off. You can tell that because it's got a light in it and a window on the front so you can look at the machine in operation. It's the kind of thing that if you had it in a shop you'd really want to show it somewhere prominent. So you can see the amplifier is towards the bottom right of the machine and it's got various controls on there to adjust the bass and treble and whether you want to switch between the external microphone or radio or listen to the built-in phonograph. Now you'll notice there's a bit of space above there and the reason for that is because there's space there to put a timer unit in. We mentioned earlier on this business about switching background music on and off and you could have a timer in this to do that or switch it on when you came into work in the morning and off when you left. I don't have that timer unit but that's what it looks like although I don't really want one either. Also above there there's another gap and that's for another amplifier if you wanted to drive a lot of speakers off this device. It can run a few speakers but if you've got a large installation you'll need to put an additional amplifier in the top of there. The inside of this is covered in instructions telling people what to do and what not to do because presumably you'd have someone in the office changing the records over from time to time. You don't want them breaking it. I've also got the instruction manual here and it's got some specifications, a bit of information about the machine here. We can see on the left there, at the top we've got dimensions and weights. The weight is 51 pounds. Now, this particular style of background music machine is known as the microwave in some collector circles because of supposedly its similarity in looks to a microwave. I've got to say it weighs a heck of a lot more than my microwave though, and it's quite a lot larger. And also notice this one you can get a carrying case for if you're that kind of person. Now, inside the machine at the bottom right, that's where the on-off button is and also the reject button, which is a momentary switch. Now, there is a little lever you can attach to this which is one of the things I found in the bottom of the box and if you screw that on it enables you to turn the device on and off and reject records from the outside of the case without undoing the lock on the front. Now behind that grill is where the speaker is. Of course you can attach this to additional external speakers but I'm just using it with the built-in one and that sounds pretty decent to me as well. I've got to say this thing always sounds a little bit wobbly when it's playing the underneath side of a record. It always sounds better when it's playing the top and maybe that's something I'll have to adjust in time. Now when I bought both my machines, the people that sold them threw in a few discs just to try out on them and I'm glad they did because they included some rather unusual titles. For example, these ones, even though they're to the Seberg standard, they're actually made by MTN, the Music Theatre Network. I don't know how rare those ones are, but some of the 80s ones include some particularly interesting tunes. In fact, this one includes a disco version of something that you will find familiar and I'm going to play you a 30 second montage and see how long it takes before you realise what the tune is. If you haven't got it yet, that was the theme from E.T. Now, I said it was a disco version, of course, 1982 when E.T. came out. That's a bit late for disco, really, but it definitely feels like that kind of arrangement to me. I'll have a link to it in the video description. Someone's already uploaded it to YouTube. But half of the fun with this machine, for me, is hearing these unusual instrumental arrangements of popular songs and then trying to figure out what the song is before it finishes.
obviously I'm not in the business of piracy, I'm just here to demonstrate old technology. If you want to listen to music from the Seaberg 1000 system, you don't really have to go to all this trouble. You can just go to Seaberg1000.com and stream the music through the website there. And they've also made available apps for Android and iOS. For me though, a lot of the pleasure about old technology comes from the actual devices themselves, being able to play back the music on the original equipment. Of course it's much cheaper and more convenient just to tap your finger on a glass screen, but then you miss out on all this. Okay, so we've reached the end of part one. Part two is going to be going back in time a little bit. You see, this is where I ended up with the nice Chrome BMS-1 system. And before that, I tried the BMC-1, the big ugly thing that didn't really work. However, go back a year where I first started trying to do this video, I just got hold of some discs had no equipment to play them on and was trying to find out a way to play Seaberg background music system discs without the official machines. And there are ways and means to do it and that's what part two is going to be about. But that's it for the moment. As always, thanks for watching.